Um, thank you so much, Sundar, for joining us. Um, I know this is a very busy time, uh, but we really appreciate your um, commitment to the cause, certainly. And um, and I do miss our daily check-ins, uh, but I'm sure they, they will reconvene in January. Um, but I want to start kind of in a place that maybe not everyone is aware of. I think there's a lot of folks who have heard your story. Um, we certainly um, were shocked in June of 2020 um, when we saw headlines splashed everywhere in what was being touted the first of its kind lawsuit over an allegation of caste discrimination. And I remember the back and forth conversations um, here at HAF and things just weren't adding up. We're like, this sounds and smells a little fishy, but we had no way of knowing. We we certainly didn't know you. We didn't know how we would get in touch with you. Um, and we were just as shocked as probably so many people in our um, community. Now, probably one of the most shocking things to us was the kind of xenophobic and racist rhetoric that the not just the press release, but even the complaint itself contained. I mean, it was shorthand for watch out for those dirty, nasty foreigners and they're importing their nasty ways with them. Um, and it was all pointed towards uh, South Asians and Hindus. So it was day one for us, but it wasn't for you. It was probably year three, year four, maybe longer. So I want to take us back to the beginning of this sordid tale. And I'm pin going to pinpoint that as when you first met John Doe. Um, you, were, uh, you knew each other from back in India. Um, and so start there. How did you know John Doe? Yeah, um, this is fairly public record at this point. But first of all, uh, Swag and HAF, just wanted to thank you for having me and um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to a wider audience. Um, especially for a story that uh, the press refuses to report. Uh, but I think the truth is important and um, uh, it's important to disseminate um, what it is. Uh, I've, I've known John Doe since 1994, um, ever since we went to uh, uh, the Indian Institute of Technology for undergrad together mm -hmm. um, and uh, lost touch with him uh, a fair bit uh, after we graduated. Uh, and I reached out to him in 2015 uh, a year into, you know, me sort of ruminating on the startup and uh, setting things in process at Cisco. So I started uh, the, the the startup company with Cisco in September of 2015. And I reached out to John Doe in roughly a couple months uh, prior to that. And um, so I've known John Doe as, um, you know, a, a colleague back in undergrad as a classmate um, and uh, also roughly in the friend circle and, and an acquaintance. So. so so you reach out to him. Um, you're obviously um, you're you're starting a, a Cisco um, startup that's or rather a startup that's being incubated in Cisco. Um, you want to bring the best team together. Um, what did you do to do that? And um, what was it about John Doe that, you know, made you reach out to him? Yeah, um, you know. The, the generic thing in, in hiring, whether it be Silicon Valley or for the matter, most other workplaces is you go and hire the best people for the job. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a very unique situation. I had jumped in from a, a career starting in networking and software back to hardware for almost 15-ish years and then came back to build this company, which was back to a software company. So I was just getting back into a number of things, meeting folks, building resources, building building a network of uh, software engineers to incubate the startup called Candid, in fact. So when we when we started Candid, in a period of 18 months, we had to hire almost 60 plus people, including mm -hmm. consultants and students. We've gone to almost 80 plus folks. And so that hiring was intense and I had to go and hire experts in many different areas. Um, I hired John Doe no differently than anybody else, which is, um, you're looking for a particular form of expertise. You reach out to eight to 10 people in that space. Uh, hiring is very tough in Silicon Valley. Pulling out people is not easy because they're in existing startups and jobs and cushy packages to some extent. Right. Um, and so um, I reached to John Doe for a particular expertise in, in an area, uh, but I won't go into the specifics of the details given where we are. 
um, and uh, solicited him. Uh, he was amongst, I think, more than seven or eight candidates uh, that we had interviewed for the position. Some whom we had interviewed prior, who had accepted and then rescinded because uh, it's a competitive valley. Um, and it took a, a period of three to four months where we closed on uh, John Doe's position. So I have two questions, um, and you can answer them in, in whatever order, but you talk about this competitive market. Um, you know, people have cushy packages. So what does Sundar Iyer do to ensure that he gets the best people? Um, you, I know you've told people what you did, but, you know, I think people need to know um, what you um, were willing to give up to bring the best team to make sure that this baby of yours, Candid, um, yeah. would see successful fruition. Yeah. So, I mean, Candid was my foray back into software and distributed systems and big data, if you will. And uh, Candid was actually focused on um formally verifying networks. That was the core idea of Candid, which is how do you ensure the truth in a data center or a network to prevent mistakes? Uh, and funnily enough, you know, technology parallels life because uh, I think my, my bigger journey on truth has not been about uh, data centers and the internet, but it's been about uh, humans and human behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, your, your particular question, um, you're looking to which particular aspect, Sohag, on Candid? So in recruiting, when you're right. recruiting a oh, yeah. team, right? In, you're you're a startup. There must have been some benefit for you to incubate yeah. it at Cisco. No, I, absolutely. So we we had raised you know several tens of millions of dollars in funding from Cisco. And uh, what I chose to do, I was the CEO and founder of the startup. Was um, I I told Cisco I would be giving away a hundred percent of my equity. Mm -hmm. um, so I essentially took nothing. My right. what's called the PRSU grants, these are technical word for the stock grants, is dollar zero uh, in the startup. And I gave it away to all of my employees, including to John Doe, uh, who made a package of several millions of dollars. So these packages to these early stage employees were far beyond what would be um, given to a Silicon Valley uh, engineer. And what's interesting here is these packages come with a lot more surety than any other normal startup. They're not stock options of a company that could eventually become big. These mm -hmm. are stock grants. You actually give away Cisco stock, uh, which are of course publicly traded. You can sell them for um, a fair cushy sum of money. And so yeah. John Doe made several millions of dollars as did several others in the company, um, uh, partly because of you know how well we both treated them, how well Cisco treated them, and of course, I personally um, sacrificed to to build a good and loyal team. Right, right. And so you're saying you have hired 60 people. Um, give me an idea of the makeup, uh, because the way that, you know, the CRD, the Civil Rights Department, California Civil Rights Department, which is the key body um, that is the enforcing arm for non-discrimination law in the state, um, they're painting a picture of, you know, all Indians running amok, uh, bringing their discriminatory hierarchies um, with them to America. Um, but from what I understand, that's not what your department looks like. You know, uh, it's it's a funny thing when when people put a sort of identity politics to to different things. If you uh, to give you an analogy, if you went to university and you looked at digital signal processing groups uh, almost fifteen to twenty years back, you find a large number of Iranians. For no other reason, from the fact that you know many Iranian students work in that field. Uh, if you look at networking, it's not uncommon that networking groups, especially a combination of hardware and software, tend to be more Indian and Chinese um, uh, dominated from the perspective of the size of their populations. It's because many of them tend to go there. Uh, right. This is almost nothing to do with discriminatory hiring practices. Now, at Cisco, Cisco definitely has a larger percentage of uh, Asian employees um, in particular fields than the the, the average. Uh, but the hiring has always been about merit, has been always, Silicon Valley uh, is thirsty for talent. Um, and I went out and hired as many good people as I could find given the time frame. You got to remember, it's a very different thing when you get 10 years to hire 60 people. It's mm -hmm. a very different thing when you get a single year. When you get one year to hire uh, uh, a bunch of people, and we're trying to hire experts, not just run-of-the-mill engineers, 
uh, you go and seek out, of course, the world, and you also seek out your network, and you pretty much try to find the best you can. We had um, people from several ethnicities, we had white American engineers, we had European engineers, we had engineers from Russia, we had um, engineers from Asia, Taiwan, uh, and a number of other countries. Um, of course, uh, the CRD uh, uh, has a reckless indifference to the truth, so they painted the group as entirely Indian. Right. Well, and I mean, the entire H-1B program, um, the reason those numbers continually go up is we do have a talent shortage in the United States. And so you do see people coming from different countries from across the world to help the United States retain a competitive edge. So, you know, to your point, it's 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 a combination of things. It, you can't just look at skin color and say, oh, there must be discrimination at play here. So 2015 to 2016, you're building this fantastic team on like rapid fire speed. When do things start going sour? Yeah, so I think you set this up with, you know, what happened before the lawsuit and something we haven't uh, ever discussed. And there's probably a three part sequence here. Um, the first part, let's call that year one of sadness, if you will, is um, the John Doe um, in the sort of first year when he was um, at, at Candid, uh, there were several complaints on him. Uh, there were complaints beginning with senior engineers who complained about his work ethics. Um, and so we had to make a number of decisions uh, because remember when he came in, I gave him the same thing that I give to any employee, which is, you know, shower them with help, shower them with resources, give them the absolute benefit of doubt, stand by them when there are complaints by them, help them, and in fact, personally get involved. I mean, I've literally spent 90 hour weeks on this startup in Candid for my employees, doing things for them, fixing architectural bugs, getting them resources, hiring and, you know, pushing within Cisco. I mean, remember, there are several organizations within Cisco all looking for dollars and resources. I did the best I could for these employees mm -hmm. and including for John Doe. But there are complaints on John Doe. Um, ones that initially I could hold, I could fend off, I could fix by maybe giving him some resources. But at some point, you know, the, the sort of drops become a river and the river becomes an ocean. Right. Um, so we have complaints from senior colleagues on Doe. Uh, we had complaints later um, by his own junior members on the team. And some complaints begin as soft complaints, They and then they become harder complaints. So soft complaints could be simply things like not turning up for work, not being available to answer questions, shirking responsibilities, or taking the easy path, right? And so you have, with engineering, as with everything else, the devil's in the details, and so uh, let me let me focus on one aspect, which is taking the easy path. If you want to do a complex software design, right, mm -hmm. there, there are ways to, you know, cut short the process. You use an external, um, you know, database, for example, throw something in, cook it up, and it works, voila. But it may not be scalable. It may not be resilient. Uh, there may be bugs. There may be features that the system doesn't support. And so you've got to continuously improve these processes. You can't say, hey, I've done it, and it's, it's done and dusted once and for all. And so we had a series of these complaints. And uh, while I had to move resources away from Doe and reduce his responsibilities, uh, one plus year down the line, he comes in. And when he doesn't make the head of engineering position, he files uh, uh, sort of internal complaints against me. Hmm. Uh, um, did he apply for that position? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, not only did he not apply for the position, but <laughs> You can see a pattern of behavior where he never wanted leadership positions. I mean, initially he would say, I'll, I'll do it, you know, when you shower him. But the moment you give it, he is shirking responsibility. He's not hiring in a personal. And we've shared all of this with the CRD. You have an employee that you're showering resources on, mm -hmm. but who refuses to hire at a pace that is needed. We have emails from him where he does not ask for a team for the next year's budget. I asked right. the man, how many people do you need to succeed to phase two of the project? Literally yeah. asked for a half an engineer or one. It's insane, right? When you're trying to build a tech startup, managers want the best of talent. You want tons of money to hire and you're planning a year ahead. He doesn't want these. And we've shared this with the CRD, you know, coming to uh, more details in, in a bit. But the short answer to you, year one was bizarre. You have an employee who is not performing, several complaints on him. We've done the best we can. 
And he then files a complaint saying that he didn't make the head of engineering position, a position that he never formally applied for. Right. So he files this complaint. Um, and I, I want to get a better idea of what does what does that internal, and I know this is going to help a lot of folks um, in the audience because we all work somewhere. Um, what does an investigation look like? What did this investigation look like? Both from, let's first maybe talk about the Cisco side of things and then maybe the CRD side of things because it's a sequential, um, you know, sequential events. So what does that look like when, when a complaint gets filed against you? Yeah, it's actually, uh, uh, how do I say this? I mean, I think different people receive things differently. When I first saw the complaint, it sends a cold shiver down your spine, right? I've spent 40 plus years of my life before such a complaint being the rock for whomever I could be, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a leader, you sacrifice, you eat the last, you sleep the last, you come in first to work. You do pretty much everything you can, but the, the, the nature of the complaint was so bizarre that mm -hmm. to me, it's shocking. And what you see is mostly the cast complaint, but John Doe made several other complaints on my character. And I'll, I'll touch upon one other in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cast complaint was, was, was essentially right there, right? Where he claims I've discriminated him based on his cast. In a group, as, as you well know, I've, I've spoken several times, in a group where there was a, another Dalit candidate, a person who self-identified as Dalit, who John right. Doe knows, by the way. John Doe knows this other Dalit senior colleague of ours. Um, and who got all of these leadership positions. And he's now John Doe is claiming that I'm discriminating against Dallas. It was just so bizarre. And especially given the history and the record against him, uh, mm -hmm. for him to want the very top position, this is not like a minor thing that he wanted. You suddenly want to go from not coming into work with all these complaints to the very top position was very personally tough. The second right. thing I realized, and there's a lot of learning here, is the deep shock that goes through when your most empathetic and nice words are misconstrued mm -hmm. against you. Yeah. And it's shocking because now your brain starts working and thinking 10 levels ahead and thinking, what are all the nice or good things or factual things that you have said that can be twisted by someone for no reason whatsoever? Right. There are many factual things we say, including in today's conversation that's recorded, that you can pick and tease apart and try to paint an intent right. beyond that. So that that was very concerning. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing that was concerning, of course, was just the scathing quantitative nature of the attack. Um, this wasn't just like a one off request saying, well, I got discriminated or I think I should have gotten the job. It was a personal attack. Right. Uh, and that's when, you know, you're dealing with. Um, this is this is hardly an employment issue. This is a human behavior issue. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with someone, um, I, I'm not going to use qualitative words on this, though there are several meaningful choice words, but a behavior that is pervasive. When you are at the receiving end of that, but, and you know, we, we've seen cases outside civil cases, which are about domestic abuse, physical abuse, harassment, uh, you know, couples uh, going through really bad and bizarre phases. This is no different, right? right. Um, it's it's one person whom and whom you're forced to be married with. The person happens to be in your group, right? So yeah. there's no easy get going away, and you're in a startup that has to perform, and he has a responsibility that he's been hired for. So now you're in the, stuck in this boat, and you're going to face continuous assaults for the next one and a half years. And John Doe made several complaints. Literally a week or two, there was something new that he would cook up. Um, and literally I was left, uh, you know, empty handed there. So at the time that he files this complaint, the the position's already been offered to someone else who self-identifies as Dalit. Um, right. Is Cisco asking these questions? At what point is CRD get involved? And is Cisco, is CRD given this information? Yeah, so um, before the uh, CRD involvement, there's a second phase to this, as 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 you asked, which yeah. is, of course, Cisco's involved. Cisco is obligated to look at the complaint. John mm -hmm. Doe's making complaints literally every second week. And, you know, Cisco's harassed equally. You have a new HR person that gets assigned 
uh, again and again, and they'll put a new HR person when he wants to restart an investigation. He has the internal right to appeal the investigation. So this goes on ad nauseum. And not just me, he did the same thing with other managers after I left. Mm. Um, and, and so you have a system that is being hijacked. Right. Mm -hmm. Because when an, an employee takes one minute to sh shoot an email, the company is obligated to spend hundreds of hours on that. And Cisco did everything they could. They went and interviewed 20 plus people, as far as I know. Um, and the CRD has all of that. Um, and think about the personal toll it takes where you have a you have a manager. I've tried to do the best for my employees. And a company now is obligated to go to each of my reports and ask, did this man say anything about caste? Does this mm -hmm. man say anything about blah? It's, it's to, to use the word, it's, it's an anal poke, if you will. Um, you know, I don't know how, how better to say it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there's probably much worse words or much worse analogies. Probably. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's gut wrenching, to say the least. Yeah. Do you go from being a leader, helping and being happy and, and bringing uh, all of that to internally being completely demolished, even though outside you've still got to do the best for your team. Right, right. Um, so I I'm going to just pivot a little bit here. Um, I guess there's the most asked question as to why I'm referring to John Doe as John Doe. I apologize. It's by habit. Um you know, back in probably, I don't know, two or three years ago, I did a really deep dive into all the court records and I had figured out who John Doe was because um, neither he nor the CRD did a very good job of actually hiding his identity when there's such a public profile available. So I will refer to him as his actual name. Chetan Narsude is his name. Um, so for everyone who's asking that question, you can stop asking it now. I will correct myself. It was just a matter of habit. So <laughs> I apologize on that. So um, back to back to kind of the sequence um, where you're, let, let's shift to the CRD. What are you telling the CRD? I mean, you're thinking, okay, well, one, why is the CRD involved, right? Because clearly something has happened internally um, and maybe you thought that the issue was resolved, um, but now all of a sudden the CRD is there. Walk yeah, us just that. Touch, right, just to touch on that last aspect, I actually never have thought that the issue would be resolved. And I'll tell you why. Uh, uh, I've spent you know 20 years building startups, I've seen several people. And weirdly enough, in November 2016, when he filed his first complaint, I only came to know about it in December 2016. Uh, there was another court case, um, which was um, uh, the uh, the gender discrimination lawsuit against Kleiner Perkins mm -hmm. uh, by Evan Bob. And for good or for bad, I mean, analogies are, are only that useful. I knew that John Doe would, you know, push this as far as he can. Mm -hmm. um, and he would push it in a way that he would have to spend zero resources on his own. Uh, it's just the nature of the person in, in, in interacting. Uh, when you're that, um, and I knew that just from looking at a salary uh, complaint, if you will, you know, when someone's making millions of dollars and they've given away that, and you are so pushing for that, you know, few extra thousand dollars of annual increase, right. um, just more details that you, you, you know, the nature of the person. So nothing that he did or is doing is surprising to me. Hmm. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, but the CRD got involved after 2018. Right, and I'll walk you through some of that process. Yeah. Um, in in the CRD's involvement, there's a phase where uh, there's a year of basically what's called interrogatories. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a subpoena. They took a bunch of HR records, and I gave them copious amounts of records. I personally sent more than six fifty or sixty box folders of records on John Doe, including date wise and chronological records. I'm not and surprised. So, go ahead. I said I'm not surprised. Right. And, <laughs> And many of these records show that John Doe's claims cannot be true. That's mm -hmm. the sad thing um, that I wanted to share, which is they're aware of the cause and effect um, dates that cannot be true. They're aware of uh, contradictions by John Doe where he takes both sides of the same claim. They're aware of purely factually inaccurate claims by John Doe. They're aware of certain things he said and did uh, with other managers other than me who have complained. Mm. They chose, 
And I, I sincerely thought, here is where one thing I was wrong. I sincerely thought that the CRD would be an honest broker. Right. And I was so wrong on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I just assumed with so much amount of information data, with more than, you know, every manager he worked for, and some of the managers' names are not even in the current complaint, that have, have complained about him. And they're all on different independent things. They're not on like a single aspect of behavior. It's not like me sitting and orchestrating things with 10 different managers, right? I leave, I go, he has issues on different things. There's issues on coming into work, uh, doing stuff, um, shirking responsibilities. You know, there's, there's things where he wants to be an architect, right? Mm -hmm. You know, where he just wants to, you know, come in and talk about reading code and he calls that. Word. There's a lot of details here, but the CRD uh, was what surprised me the most. It's not an honest broker, right? Mm -hmm. and so they didn't interview people that they should have. Mm -hmm. uh, the interviews for Ramana and me, you know, were about 15 minutes. Most of it is just rank and file questions. What's your name, first name, last name, title, department, and blah. Instead of getting into the weeds, I mean, it's seven years. They claim a hostile to Dalit environment. And they don't even bother to interview the other candidate who self identified as Dalit leader right. of the group. Right. Um, so there's a whole one and a half years of interrogatories, responses, subpoenas, followed by two mediations where CID has never been a meaningful or honest broker. I can't go into the details of the mediation because of mediation confidential confidentiality. But if right. you look at Tesla's lawsuit against the CID, they say it's essentially the same thing. <laughs> Uh, the CRD doesn't want to get involved. There's not a single piece of objective conversation they want to have. It's all about throwing rocks at you and mm -hmm. making claims that they can force a settlement on. In fact, uh, you know, just hot of the press, yesterday, Cisco filed two motions for sanctions against the CRD for very similar behavior where the CRD refuses to answer any of the interrogatory questions that Cisco has posted. Right. It's almost, um, look, most cases settle out of court, right? And um, it, it's a it's a bullying tactic. Um, I, I mean, kudos to Cisco, uh, because I think nine times out of 10 with my conversations um, with friends who are in labor and employment law, nine times out of 10, you're settling out of court. Companies just want this to go away, even if they know that, um, you know, discrimination likely did not occur. Um, certainly when it did occur, they're going to try to settle out. But a lot of times when it hasn't occurred, they also want to settle out of court because they just want to make this problem go away. I mean, it's it's not easy. Now we're 2023. They've been dealing with this since 2018, I guess, right? So um, they could have very well um, have let it go. I, I want to just be mindful of time. Um, so I'm going to kind of combine my last two questions um, for you. And that is... Um, and I'll just ask them both so then you can answer both of them. But if you had to do it all again, or rather, if you had to go through it again, uh, I, for one, would have loved to have just erase this entire chapter um, from history because there's been such a reverberating effect um, for the entire community, whether it's, you know, campuses justifying their adding caste to their policies on the basis of Cisco, which is still not out of the courts, um, whether it's the city of Seattle, whether it was the state of California. Um, so obviously I would want this entire thing to disappear, but if you had to go through it all again, is there anything that you would have done differently? Maybe one or two things on that. And the second thing I wanna ask is that you've been harmed, Ramana has been harmed. Um, by the agency that's tasked with enforcing California's non-discrimination laws. Legacy media has refused to tell your story. Um, and so in many regards, the damage that's been brought on to you by the CRD is irreversible. So what would justice look like? So those are my two questions. What lessons can we share with our audience if they ever find themselves in this that you've learned going through this ordeal? And what would what would justice look like? Yeah, I mean, the first primary thing I would do differently, um, and it's a hard thing because we're wired in a certain way, is stop being nice to someone who continues to push the envelope, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, I, I had assumed, just given the circumstances, that getting away, um, helping, assuaging, uh, would, you know, help things here, right? I mean, 
you know, if, if he chose not to come in for work, I, I left him alone, right? Mm -hmm. Because you always want about a retaliation claim and stuff. But at some point, you got to push back as a manager really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and I did to, to a certain extent, but you've got to prevent a truant employee from continuing this process for months and months on end. And to that end, I think we need a lot of improvements in the workplace in terms of, uh, I haven't thought this through fully, but you know, you need an equivalent of a three strikes law. You know, what happens when an employee makes, you know, the three complaints on the employee by three different people? At what point is there an automatic process that says, hey, we're going to severe, right? Um, right. What, what are things that um, you can do to help managers, um, you know, handle these situations better? For example, when HR reaches out to any employee, most employees are extremely, some are just worried. This is like, oh, HR, oh, what is HR? But you got to smoothen that process, right? So people um, shrivel up. People are afraid uh, when bad things happen. When you have one truant actor, everyone jumps away from that person. But we actually got to train people to do the reverse. We got to train supervisors. We got to train colleagues. We got to train junior engineers to complain about bad actors even more, more forcefully and more vehemently. Um, you know, one single manager cannot, you know, handle uh, everything. You need a team of concerted people who say, enough is enough. We're going to complain. We're not we're just going to put up with it. Uh, that's one. Um, there's, there's a lot of learning there. Uh, there's, but, but the learning also needs to come with what can we do to fix it? My biggest learning from this process is your best behavior, your most empathetic behavior, your most truthful behavior can be held against you. And that is so wrong. If you live in a world where you have an agency that wants to misconstrue your best actions, then what recourse do you have, right? And so we need ways to fix that, whether that be, you don't need to wait eight years to know that answering someone's uh, IIT rank, honestly, in a job interview is not harassment, right? It should be obvious in the room that. Quickly to answer your second question, what does justice look like? I think there's many forms of justice. We need better laws, um, you know, laws that can help against uh, retaliation against supervisors. If you look at the current record from the data, it's very clear that John Doe retaliated against me. Mm -hmm. uh, what recourse do we have? So we need laws that protect supervisors as much as, you know, non-supervisors. We need uh, the CRD to be brought to justice. That is an absolute important aspect. I don't know what that looks like, but I know the process. The process has to be someone bigger than the agency, um, you know, whether it be political or the Department of Justice. Someone needs to investigate this agency, not just on behalf of Hindus or Indians, but what they're doing to Californians in general. Nice. Um, and I'm committed to that cause to make that happen. Well, I look forward to working with you on that because I, I wholeheartedly agree with you that you can't have the key agency that's, um, set up to enforce non-discrimination laws discriminating against Californians.